Hi everyone and welcome to my Q3 um, quarterly call. Uh, thank you so much for those who have done the poll. It's only for my own benefit. It's um, the first time that I'm also running the conference call on my own. So uh, perhaps you have attended these before, perhaps it's your first time. Uh, usually they're, they're hosted by eToro. eToro sends out the invite. Uh, but this time, because there's so much happening in the market, as well as in my portfolio, um, I thought it's best to open the invite to everybody uh, and have it a second time to make sure that people at different times are all able to um, attend. Um, so yeah, the date on there is simply because it was the first time that I ran the event. And so the data was first publicized uh, on Tuesday of this week. Um, so yeah, we have a lot to get through and please put any questions uh, uh, into the box. I usually keep an eye on them uh, and answer them as we go along. But if I don't get to any of them, I will make sure to address them at the end of the session. So our agenda for today will be a brief introduction uh, to myself. Some of you may have seen this before. For some of you, it will be the first time. Uh, so I'll keep that brief. I'll also just review the investment strategy before I do a review of the market and my portfolio for the first half of this year. Uh, and then I'll also talk a little bit about my market outlook for the remainder of the year, as well as how I have positioned the portfolio to prepare for those different scenarios. Uh, so I am Heloise Grief. I am uh, the person behind the Ruby MZA portfolio on eToro. Uh, I started the portfolio six years ago and I have been uh, managing it since then. I have over $30 million of assets under copy, nearly 17,000 copiers and 175,000 followers. Uh, and I'm also part of the eToro Legacy Club um, for having consistent years in profit for the last uh, four years. Uh, so a brief introduction just to myself. Uh, I came to the UK to do uh, a master's and an MBA at Oxford University. I'm originally from Cape Town, South Africa, uh, and I then returned to Oxford to do a PhD in machine learning before uh, working for a number of startups in East Africa, as well as um, India. I've also won a number of awards related to my work in AI uh, and tech, um, which I'm very proud of. And I continue to work in that space. Uh, and as you know, a lot of my portfolio was not only built around using machine learning algorithms as part of my analysis, uh, but it also helps me to analyze um, how companies are introducing this into um, their workflow, not only tech companies specifically. So just a couple of personal highlights from me. As you know, it, I recently announced that in July, uh, I became a full-time popular investor. So uh, that's something I've, I'm quite excited about. And um, I look forward to working with uh, all of you and getting some feedback from you about how I can shape this role, because obviously my time for managing and um, managing the portfolio and the investments has always been protected. Um, that's not going to change. But of course, now I hope to have more time to uh, do a number of other things, uh, including this time having the second conference call to make sure that more people can meet with me during live uh, meetings and not just always recordings and um, YouTube videos. So uh, in June, we also had our first uh, Global Popular Investor Summit, which was in London. It was a wonderful event. There was over 200 popular investors and um, it was great to meet them, not only to talk about the stock market, but also some of the challenges of being a popular investor. Uh, and I think Itoro was very excited to host this event, which they have been planning for a number of years. Uh, and one of the things I'm quite excited, I'll come back to it in the end, but I'm also launching my own copier survey. It'll be going out on my newsletter, which you can sign up for on uh, either the QR code or the link here. 
And the idea of that is really just to get your input and your feedback of what you expect from a popular investor and what are the sort of additional services that I would be able to focus on or offer now that um, I am a full-time popular investor. So at a time like this, when the market is really volatile, uh, and because um, that's partly why I had the poll in the beginning, just to get a sense of who is in the audience, um, because I think, as I mentioned, this portfolio has been going for six years, and particularly when the market is incredibly volatile as it, as it is in the moment, I think it's important to review um, sort of what the strategy of the portfolio is and also remind yourselves and myself why we committed to that um, because I think you should be very wary if your popular investor or anybody is sort of starting to do massively random random things and deviating from their original investment strategy particularly during a time like this. So the three main pillars of my investment strategy which I set out in the beginning of the portfolio and continues to be uh, the core of uh, the portfolio is number one is the focus on compounded growth. So we'll look at that in a minute when we look at the long term outlook of and performance of the portfolio. That's something I've always focused on. Uh, this was always intended to be a medium risk, medium return portfolio, something which I have prioritized, especially over the last two years, but making sure that I take those profits um, and reinvest them so that we can get that compounded growth over the long term. The second thing, which is even more important at the minute, is to make sure that I'm managing the risk, keeping our, our risk score within kind of three to four is what I set out to, uh, and making sure that the decisions I make is um, deliver, delivering the sort of portfolio that uh, you signed up for when you decided to copy me. Uh, and then finally, of course, using strong fundamentals to interpret um, uh, kind of what's going on in the uh, economy. And built on a second layer of that is my own addition. So as I mentioned, that's the use of the AI and machine learning algorithms through uh, bespoke algorithms that I built five years ago. Uh, and those sort of, it's not a full robo uh, investment portfolio, but instead I use it as a decision support tool to help me make a decision when I'm deciding whether or not to look at a certain sector or whether I am deciding to invest in a certain stock or not. And then finally using um, the times that we're living in. So that's trading on eToro on the platform where there is very low or limited fees uh, because of course those can also really add up over time. Uh, and then finally, uh, I've also been quoted for my use of analyzing the hive mind. So looking at larger cultural trends that are happening outside of just the fundamentals to try and predict sort of where um, you know we're going to go in the future. So with that kind of uh, fresh in our mind, let's have a review of what happened in the market for the first half of this year. Uh, of course, I think um, when uh, investors knew that after the last two years with COVID-19, that 22, 2022 would be a really bumpy ride. I've been talking about it since the beginning of the year. But if we look back at the first half of the year now, I think that nobody really expected it to be quite as bumpy as it's been. In fact, it's been, uh, you know, one of the most turbulent first halves the global markets have seen in many de decades. And in a big sense, it's almost been the perfect storm of everything that has been happening. Uh, and that was like in great part driven by inflation and recession fear, something which I've been talking about uh, in almost every post uh, for the last, you know, however long. And so, uh, when the world's most influential central bank, the US Federal Reserve, was really serious about raising interest rates, that was largely, you know, driven by the fact that we have seen 40-year highs uh, and the Fed Fed's really set out on the fastest course of interest rate rises since uh, 1994. Uh, and that really had a hard knock on on the market. It wiped about 13 trillion uh, in the stock in the global stock market. In fact, the MSCI World Stocks, which is an index that looks at 46 countries, so basically all the countries that have 
um, stock markets saw its biggest uh, H1, which is the first half of the year, fall since the index was created in in 20 in 1990 so it's really been in many ways um uh yeah a very turbulent year and very few places to hide because at the same time while this was happening in the stock market the bond market where which is usually a good place to kind of hide when there's this much turmoil in the equities um they also saw um you know the biggest um first half of their, the worst first half uh, in the bond market uh, since 1788, so even longer than the stock market. Uh, the treasuries lost more than 13%, um, and that's the most uh, that they've ever gone down since the US Constitution was ratified in 1788. Uh, and compounded with that, of course, we had the cryptos, um, the crypto markets have really been hammered uh, with the recent collapse collapse of Terra USD uh, and Luna, which were the stable coins, uh, as well as the Bitcoin slump losing 55% of its value this quarter. Uh, and we've also seen the same with the pressure on the big tech companies. Um, those two have really sort of uh, impacted the portfolio a lot in the first half of this year. Uh, some of the upsides have been the commodity rally, which has been the strongest since the World War I. Uh, commodity has really pushed oil up um, by 50%, gas went up by 60%, and a lot of this has now resulted in the European energy crisis or the cost of living crisis. Um, but this has also been the biggest the first half of the year H1 gain for crude since 2009. Uh, and overall, commodities as asset class looks like it's on course for its best year since 1915. So, uh, you know, it's really been a lot going on. It's also not been a smooth ride for the commodities. Copper went down 20% since March and uh, nickel and zinc has also been de decompressed uh, a lot since this year. So everywhere that tends to be a safe haven traditionally um, has seen a lot of volatility because of all of these um, factors that we've seen moving. Some of this was obviously not caused, but definitely fueled by the invasion of Russia into the Ukraine, uh, after which Russia was essentially gouged out of the global financial system uh, and the country's sovereign, sovereign credit rating was downgraded by almost uh, the biggest margins we've seen in history. Uh, and then, as I said, the government bonds were, um, were lost 13%. And this was really significant because they're supposed to be a really safe place normally. They're definitely not expected to lose more than 10% in, in such a short six month window. Uh, so this became really unfamiliar territory for investors. Uh, and the key difference this time was really the fact that central banks have seen markets come under pressure, you know, leading up to this time, but they really haven't reacted as they should have, because uh, I think in a lot of senses, they were still trying to shield their economies against uh, the coronavirus uh, impact. And so the sort of delayed reaction from them leading up to these factors have really left us in, in quite a bit of a mess. Um, so what does that, uh, you know, mean for the portfolio? I think there's really uh, not much hiding. When I took this screenshot uh, in the beginning of the week, the portfolio was down um, 30%. We've had some relief in the last few days, uh, and this can be really painful for first-time investors to see or to experience. Um, it's sort of in line. We sort of Sometimes we lag, sometimes we lead our benchmarks between the NASDAQ and the S&P. So it's really not unrelated to what's happening in the rest of the market. Of course, we are trying, uh, I'm trying my very best to make sure that we do sort of inch ahead uh, and we're not down by as much as the rest of the market because that's really what you want to have. So instead of focusing on, on the portfolio performance, I'll talk about a few key events that happened, which I think was abnormal um, 
and I communicated during the course of the quarter, uh, but perhaps it's just worthwhile going over them quickly. So the first thing was what I call the red readjustment. So if you've been copying me for a long time, you'll know one of my key um, sort of ways to manage the portfolio was uh, to never close a, posi a position in red. So where, where, where the average kind of portfolio management close about 80%, roughly ballpark figure, close about 80% of their positions in, in profit. Um, at the start of this year, I was about at just over 90%. So one of my core things were to regularly close in profit and reinvest those profits to make sure that we get that compounded growth over a long period. Um, and when we met in the last quarter, quarterly call in April, um, I said that I'm holding on to some of these losses, trying to, to make sure that we can recoup those before I close them. Uh, but I did go through a really hard red readjustment, as I call it, in, in about June. And this was for two reasons mainly. One was, as you know, eToro has a risk score. So this was largely to manage my risk score by reducing my drawdown in the portfolio. Um, it, it's really important that I do remain close as possible to the risk score that I uh, intend to give to my copiers. And so a lot of that was around risk score management. Uh, but the second thing was around some of my scenario analysis uh, for the risk adjusted returns indicated that uh, there is a better potential to cut some of those losses um, even though in a regular long-term hold portfolio, you can hold those and potentially make it back. It's also a question about how long it takes you to make those back. Uh, and in my different scenario analysis, it did become clear that cutting those losses and taking, uh, taking the loss at this point, I could use the cash that was being freed up to um, try and invest it elsewhere and potentially recover at a faster rate than I would have by just holding on to those positions. So that was something which was a bit unusual. I've, I don't usually do that, but uh, through multiple scenario analysis, I felt that that money would be better invested somewhere else. The second thing, of course, was the fund deposit, which happened on the 1st of July. Some of you may have seen the video which I put out yesterday. Uh, if you did see it, uh, apologies, because this will be a bit of a repeat. If you didn't see it, I'll just give a summary. So on the 1st of July, I deposited about 64%, I think it was. Uh, I made a statement saying that I'm going to do that about a week before and saying that I'll give another week until the 6th of July uh, before I use the funds. Um, this was done purely to uh, reiterate my commitment to my copiers um, as I was going full time to put more of my personal funds into the portfolio. But it was also a bit to practice what I preach, because if you look at any of my posts leading up to basically the last six to eight months, in all of them, I was saying this is a good time to buy. The market is down. If you have any additional funds, this is a good time to buy. This is a good time to buy. Uh, and so a lot of you were asking, uh, when are we depositing again? Because if you have been copying me for a long time, you might remember that at some point we were depositing together every month consistently at the start of the month, I would put some money, you would get a notification, uh, and a lot of you joined uh, in that fund deposit, uh, purely because that's also my investment philosophy. It's an age old kind of way to financial freedom, making sure that you keep uh, dollar cost averaging, adding to your portfolio at the, uh, over the long time. Um, the main feedback was around the short notice that I gave for that. Um, and as I said in the video yesterday, the main reason for that was because I didn't want to put pressure on my copiers, given that we have global inflation, given that we have the cost of living crisis uh, around the world and that people may not have uh, additional funds available. So in consultation with eToro, it was decided that I would give short notice um, and that people who could add would add and people who were not able to add at this point, um, you know, or would add a smaller amount could do that. But that was really the main objective. So in a long term portfolio, which this is that, uh, you know, you sign up to for five to 10 years, a few months of de-thinking uh, we felt would not be 
be a major thing if you look in the five to 10 year span, because I do have an average turnaround of three months on my positions. Um, so whatever little cash balance we had before I made the deposit, if you did not deposit, that would just be used in the same proportion that I'm using uh, the new deposit. Uh, and of course, you may have noticed that I made that deposit and a lot of that is still sitting there. So there's also questions around why did we make a big deposit and it's still sitting there. Uh, I'll talk about that specifically when I'm talking about the uh, portfolio positioning because it is quite a powerful tool. Uh, and then finally, uh, there was also some experimentation with selling, uh, mostly Airbnb and Mercado Libre. Both of them were quite uh, profitable. So that's something I might continue to do to try and hedge around some of the downturn that's happening. Although I do keep, keep the hedging really small. Uh, if you look at this, you'll see that I keep it limited to less than 5% and way less than that, that I try to do this uh, little bit of deviation from the original strategy. But this is all done in an attempt to, to hedge against some of the downturn. Uh, the other thing I've been doing is using leverage, which I also don't usually do. But again, I'm doing in a very contained, very limited way as part of the strategy. Uh, and that's hedging, uh, leveraging. Uh, there was a bit of commodities. Uh, and that also was a, a bit uncomfortable for some copiers because usually when you're using leverage um, that we had a bit, it was few, I think it was six positions that I, I used leveraged on. Uh, we had about 55% uh, hit rate. So 55% of them were positive, which is really good for a short term strategy like that. Um, but I got the sense that it was really uncomfortable for a lot of copiers because it's not a usual strategy again, uh, in my portfolio to see that much of red coming through. Uh, but usually if you are doing hedging like that, you want to make sure that at least the green or the profitable positions outweigh the, the losses that you're doing in the hedging. So those are sort of key, the three key events of things that has changed in the portfolio um, over the last quarter that I wanted to address. Of course, if there's any other questions, uh, please put them in the, uh, in the box. Uh, so with that, um, I would just like to do a review of the portfo portfolio performance, because as I said, this is a long term portfolio. Um, my description on my Toro page says copy only if you're willing to commit for five to 10 years. The portfolio does have a history of six years, according to the um, CC, who is one of the regulators in the UK. You know, five years is the minimum sort of historical um, performance that you can show for a long term portfolio. And so we exceed that in this portfolio. And I think it's one of the key selling points is that I'm not just back testing. I'm not just like saying that this is how the portfolio might do, but I actually have the performance and the date, the real data to, to back that up. Uh, so if we look at the S&P 500 uh, since the start of 2016, which is the uh, key inception of this portfolio, um, and then compare that to, to the portfolio itself. I think the, the key thing I want to show, show by this is how the, uh, there's ups and downs in the market. Uh, sometimes we lead, sometimes we lag, but by doing this kind of compo compounded inching where we're constantly trying to be ahead of our benchmark, over time, the averaging of that uh, does tend to grow bigger and bigger in the gap as we go further into the future. And this is really one of the ad main advantages of the compounded growth over the long term. So uh, yeah, if you just joined in the last year or in the last two years, you may not see this uh, yet, but this is really the advantage of, of a long term portfolio. And yeah, this is the real data uh, of how the portfolio has done. And as I mentioned, uh, we have celebrated the last five years in green. Of course, this year we are doing our utmost best to um, come back from our downturn. We still have the second half of the year left. Um, but when I showed this graph the first time at the end of last year, uh, I also said we don't expect this to continue forever. 
there'll be good years, there'll be bad years. It's just a bit about making sure that our bad years are less bad than our benchmarks. And so that's what we're really fighting for at this moment. Uh, and we continue to uh, want to see this long-term growth exponentially pulling away from our benchmark. Uh, so with that, the review of the portfolio of the market will do a bit of a market outlook for uh, the second half of the year before we move on to how we're positioning the portfolio uh, for to take advantage of what our prospects is going forward. Um, so, of course, uh, if you've been to one of these before, you'll know that when I do the market outlook, I do a kind of bear and a bull outlook. So I do the, the negative or the pessimistic outlook, and then I do the optimistic outlook. Uh, if you've been following the stock market news, you'll know that we're squarely in a bear market at the moment. So um, that's kind of the general large scale consensus for what the rest of this year will look like. Um, it's also how the portfolio is largely positioned at the moment to take um, to be prepared for that. But of course, as I always say, it would be naive and silly to not also just keep, a, keep one eye uh, on the other side of the coin and make sure that if it does deviate very suddenly, we are ready to take advantage uh, of that. Because if the last two years have taught us anything is that the stock market can be really unpredictable as it's always been. So if we look at the first scenario, uh, which is the bear scenario, uh, in that scenario, we're saying that we're definitely going into recession, um, if not by the end of this year, early next year. Uh, BlackRock recently did the survey where they found that, um, I think it was a thousand US investors uh, in that survey, you know, inflation still remains the greatest perceived risk to the equity market for these investors for the next six months. So the rest of this year, uh, and about 50% of those investors have indicated that they are reducing their dis discretionary spending. So um, it's not only that we're saying we might think we go into recession, we're already seeing people prepare for that. And, uh, you know, with the stock market, sometimes um, it's a bit of a chicken egg. Things happen because people think they're going to happen. And so we kind of drive the economy that way. Uh, but also conversely, the, the total opposite could happen that because everybody's expecting a crash or something, it may not happen. So, um, uh, so yeah, we expect that uh, the global inflation or I expect that the global inflation and the US inflation in particular will start to surprise uh, on the downside and that we should see the Fed hiking less by less than expected. Um, however, that being said, I think all the scenario analysis agrees that the probability of a recession in the next 12 months has really increased over the last few months. And as a result of that um, growth, our growth expectations have been revised down. Uh, and specifically that brings me to my next point about earnings risks. Um, uh, I've yet to um, materially revise the earnings forecast, but I do expect that we can uh, see a lot of headwind for the equity markets. Uh, and we also expect that the Fed will continue to reduce its balance sheet uh, as guided despite the slowing inflation and growth. Um, and following the recent pullback, um, you know, we, not, we do note that even though some of the US market still screens as ex uh, expensive or above average, there are pockets of value that are starting to appear. And that's what we're trying to take advantage of. Uh, for example, the high yield corporate debt and the US uh, treasuries, we have introduced some bonds into the portfolio, which weren't there before. Um, uh, having said that, that's also because bond yields are starting to rise significantly to above inflation expectations, giving the positive real yield. Uh, and so the Fed will, with the aggressive raising of the interest and the recession fears, um, some people are anticipating that inflation expectations are starting to show signs of peaking, that, you know, it is coming to its peak. Um, but yeah, Partly back to why we haven't used a lot of the cash 
uh, that's available in the portfolio is because there is still some earnings risk. As I said, there's some headwind for the equity markets um, and there will be a lot of wild cards going forward. Um, but specifically July has offered us and continue to offer us a lot of good information uh, to assess the strength of the economy, uh, specifically the earnings seasons that has uh, kicked off in the middle of this month. Um, and that will really provide us with a much needed context about what's happening in corporate America at the moment uh, and offer some context about the economic outlook. Um, and I think, a lot of investors will be paying particularly close attention to what company executives are saying in their um, quarterly reports, specifically about uh, energy prices and supply chain bottlenecks, along with their outlook for the remainder of the year. Um, so along with that, we'll also have some other monthly reports related to employment and inflation, um, yeah, the multi-week publicly traded company reports that are coming out uh, that is kicked off. So that is partly why all of the new funds, which was added in the 1st of July, have not yet been um, used because I'm waiting for all of this information to come out through the course of July so that I can uh, finish my scenario analysis and continue ahead opening new positions with more probability and more certainty. Um, so yeah, just waiting a little bit for this information to come out, I feel uh, places us in a much stronger position uh, to make sure that we are sort of reading the outlook for the rest of the year correctly. Uh, of course, the second big, uh, uh, third big bear outlook is the European energy crisis. Uh, at the minute, the European equities screen as cheap uh, and I have, um, sort of increase the exposure to European and UK stocks in the previous quarter. Um, but they do have a greater risk of recession compared to the US, and that's really because of this energy crisis that is unfolding in Europe. So Europe and UK natural gas prices have surged in the last quarter, quarter, and it is really one of the region's worst energy fears at the minute. And this is further stoking the fear around inflation and recession risk. So even though those stocks do screen as cheaper, they have this additional risk of um, the closure of the Nord Stream pipeline and the fear that it may not open. So that's an additional factor to keep in mind, um, but there, there is strong prepara preparations to make sure that the gas storage um, will be prepared for the winter demand. But as I said, that does add this extra layer of a higher probability of recession for Europe. So we do keep that in mind when um, we are um, taking into account uh, how much exposure we want to have to the different regions. Um, so on the flip side of that, as I said, there's the clear book bear outlook. Most media outlets that you currently follow will probably give you the same sentiment. Uh, but if we do suspend that for a second and we imagine that there is a scenario where there is no recession, um, in that scenario, we'll see that the risky assets, uh, assets are currently priced um, really cheaply. Uh, because many of the equity market segments are down 60 to 80 percent. And so this is largely because positioning and sentiment of, of investors are at an almost multi-decade low. So if we do consider a scenario where there is no recession, it won't be because the world and the economies in the world are in a particularly good shape. So it won't be that anything externally causes this but it will purely be because um, almost everyone, almost every you know, average investor, almost every media outlet is expecting an economic disaster. And we know that the stock market sometimes does quite the opposite of what the general consensus is. So if we expect there to be a bubble you know, because everybody's expecting it, everybody's preparing for it. And so then often it, it can be that it doesn't happen, even though the world and all the economies are signaling that there is a great probability for uh, a recession. And so 
because of that very practical reason, we do consider the scenarios of there being no recession towards the end of the year. And so if that doesn't materialize, as I said, all the risky asset classes um, could recover most of their losses going into this, which they occurred in the first half of the year. So um, that has happened previously, that happened after the Great Depression. So if we look at this chart, um, after the Great Depression was the last time that there was such a big drop in the first half of the year. Uh, and very often, not always, very often the second half of the year can make up for that um, and recover those losses in the risky assets. So, that, so that's some of the reasons why I've kept the exposure to things like crypto, which are really risky, uh, and some of the tech stocks, which of course the sentiment is around uh, away from growth and into uh, value stocks. But because there is a small probability that we may have no recession, um, I have kept those positions in the portfolio for now to ensure that we can benefit from this recovery if it does happen, although there is a small probability. Uh, and so in the second scenario, also there's some signals that crypto uh, is proving really resilient to the latest inflation high uh, and Bitcoin held around its $20,000 mark despite, despite the latest high inflation surprise uh, and the increase in the Fed rate hike expectations. So that's sort of just for a minute, if we say, let's just consider there's another scenario. And I think it's always good to, to be prepared for for both of those. Um, and so if we do try to use hi history, although as I just said, it, it doesn't always play out the same, um, but there are certain assets that tend to do well. If we look specifically at the last 1970s inflationary period, uh, specifically commodities did quite well, again, as they did then and now, coppers kind of struggled in that. Um, cash and fixed incomes, which are bonds, tend to, you know, do, do a bit better. Uh, and then equities can be, be a bit more difficult to make uh, pro strong profits on, especially the profits that we have seen in the last two years, which have been quite abnormal. Um, and so using this as a rough guide, um, we consider both the market outlook, which I just discussed, as well as kind of historical strong sectors. Um, to discuss the asset as, asset allocation outlook. So here um, I have kept a record of what the outlook was uh, going into Q2. So in April, when I had this meeting, this was my sentiment about the mark, uh, asset allocation outlook. And going into this quarter, uh, I have put the um, just next to it. So in terms of global equities, as I just said, if we look historically, uh, last quarter, I also said the outlook uh, was less bad. It remains less bad. And this is purely as monetary policies continue to tighten. The market screens a bit expensive, specifically in the US. And as I said, we do expect some earnings downgrades. So for that reason, uh, we do have still a slightly neutral to moderately negative outlook on the global equities. Um, the fixed incomes, as I said, the global bond yields uh, are starting to see a positive uptick. And so for that, uh, in the last quarter, I have started introducing them into the portfolio. Not a lot. I think it's currently 1%, which is exposed to tips, which are uh, bonds that typically do well during inflationary periods. Um, and then, of course, the biggest kind of positive outlook does still remain cash at this point, purely because it gives a, a really good buffer uh, as an insurance policy during uncertain times, but it also just gives you uh, the ability to react quickly if, you, if the market does turn. So as I mentioned, uh, I'm not quite sure yet. Of course, it's impossible for anybody to time the market. We never try to do that. But we do try to use as much of information is available to us to kind of make an educated estimate of when the market may have reached its low. And as I said, I'm waiting for some key information to come out in July um, so that I can sort of make a very uh, informed decision about where we are on that curve, whether we are starting to see uh, uh, an upturn. And for that reason, having cash available in the portfolio is really, really desirable.
similarly, emerging markets have sort of started to screen a bit more cheaper, especially compared to developed markets. And so I've introduced a index fund giving us some exposure to China. We've had India in the portfolio before. Um, we sometimes have Brazil coming in and out, uh, but we do have about, I think, two or three percent exposure to emerging markets. Uh, similarly, with the global real estate, the valuation continues to remain high, uh, especially compared to the long term. Um, but as I said in the previous slide, also real estate can be a really useful uh, tool during inflationary periods. So we do have a couple of real, uh, real estate investment trusts in the portfolio. Uh, and then something which I introduced in the portfolio recently, of course, we've always had crypto, but if we're talking about alternative asset classes, uh, these really continue to offer a, an attractive risk adjusted return, specifically if we look at traditional long only asset classes, which this portfolio is. Um, crypto is sort of crypto and real estate investment trust are on the boundary of whether they're becoming asset classes on their own because they're so established, they're not necessarily alternatives anymore. But you know, it's debatable where they fit in. Uh, but I have also introduced a bit more exposure to alternatives specifically through carbon. So there is um, a little bit of carbon credit exposure in the portfolio to help us benefit a bit from this asset class as we're going into the second half of the year. So based on my outlook for the asset allocation, how have I um, sort of positioned the portfolio going into the second half of the year? So. I'm still waiting for all of the uh, earnings to come out, but I have, um, as I said, massively reduced the exposure to large cap and mid caps um, because of this red readjustment that I mentioned. Um, so we can expect to uh, apply some of this cash that's currently sitting in the portfolio to pick up not necessarily broader equities, but those pockets of value that I mentioned that are starting to emerge. Uh, and the same for small caps and mid caps, their valuations remain attractive. And so we will continue to have some exposure to them. The same with fixed incomes. As I said, I introduced the bonds into the portfolio last quarter. We may see a bit more exposure to that. It's currently less than 1%, so it's really small, but we are seeing um, the global bond yields uh, increase. So that would be really good to get some exposure to that. Um, cash. Yeah, we don't have to talk about that. It massively increased in the last quarter. So in this quarter, as we're starting to take advantage of these other um, opportunities, we can uh, expect it, of course, to then go down. It's currently at 43%, which is a large part of the portfolio. Uh, and I normally kept that at 20%. So we can expect that to reduce through the course of this quarter as we start to see uh, good opportunities. Uh, commodities were not always part of the portfolio. They were introduced in the portfolio in the last quarter. Uh, I don't expect there to be any change. Um, yeah, as I said, it, it continues to have positive expectations, but it also continues to be very volatile. So uh, we have about a seven or eight percent expo exposure to commodities at the moment. And I think that would remain unchanged for the rest of this quarter. Uh, and then similarly with alternatives, there are a really good way to protect the portfolio. Um, we have a really small exposure at the moment, and so we can expect that to increase uh, a little moderately over the course of this quarter. So that's our asset allocation positioning, our expectations of what might change in the portfolio going into the, this quarter. If we look at the, delve a bit deeper into the actual change by sector, in April 2022, when we last met for our last quarterly call, this was what the exposure looked like. Of course, now in July, we have this really good, healthy cash buffer sitting there, ready to be deployed whenever we see a, a good opportunity. Uh, because of that, we've also massively trimmed down tech. We've buffered up uh, our exposure to commodities, uh, financial and construction. Um, and yeah, as I discussed, the asset allocation will sort of uh, change these segmentations as we start to deploy that cash uh, going into this um, quarter. 
Um, so my final conclusion with what you uh, can expect from me going forward for the rest of the scooter and what I would uh, ask of my copiers, uh, I'll continue to do the scenario for forecasting uh, as this information comes out in July. I do my different scenario forecastings. I try to prepare and readjust and keep us aligned according to you know, what the most likely scenario is. We can never time the market. We can never kind of foresee the future, but we can try and keep uh, this forecasting as dynamic as possible to make these readjustments. Uh, and the thing that I'm really reassured about is that we do have this healthy cash buffer available uh, because I do foresee some opportunities coming into the second half of the year. Uh, even though I have, and I think at this point, it might be good to address a question which has come in from, from Claudia around the percentage for short trading uh, that I've been using to try and recover some of the portfolio. Um, so I will reiterate that this portfolio does remain net long. Uh, I'm not suddenly going to turn it into a long short portfolio. I'm not going to massively change uh, my strategy. But um, instead of, because as I mentioned with the hedging, I try and keep the exposure to less than 5%. If you remember from the graph earlier, we're currently at 2.7% that's being used for hedging. Um, because of that, I don't feel that that's a, a large enough amount to necessarily short sell um, individual stocks always or to lever leverage individual sales. Um, so for that reason, I'm also using um, uh, a composite index, so the SPXU, for example, uh, if I buy that, it um, I'm buying it, but it's sort of the, it's an index that tracks the opposite of the S and P. Um, so that kind of by buying that, I get an exposure to selling the you know the whole basket. Uh, and so because I'm keeping that percentage so small, uh, this is a really good strategy to make sure that we're not trying to stock pick in the small amount that we're shorting because that can then um, become a bit dangerous. But if there is something like, for example, Mercado Libre or Airbnb, which I'm really sure about uh, that are good shorts, uh, I will do those. But the entire shorting in the portfolio will, will remain uh, less than 5%. So um, yeah, hopefully that has answered your question. Claudia, if there's any other questions that I haven't answered yet, please continue to put them in the chat box. Um, from you, from you, my copiers, I would expect, uh, as I've always asked, that you do, um, you know, expect more increased volatility, which I think we've all like now gotten used to in the stock market, but also to have more realistic expectations of the returns that we can expect. As I've said, the last two years have been phenomenal for the stock market. Uh, it's been unprecedented returns. And so since the end of last year, even the second half of last year, I've started reminding us that, you know, we're doing as much as we can to scoop up while it's raining, uh, but we do anticipate that this period will come to an end. Um, and it's a healthy period. It's a healthy period for the ec economy to set itself and to, you know, sort of clear out any inefficiencies. So it is uncomfortable, but it is also a healthy part of market cycles. Uh, how are we going to do this? Um, I am committed to stay more, to be disciplined and patient as I've always been. And I ask the same of you, um, but I always also commit to communicating more regularly. We'll talk a bit about how I'm going to do that in the next slide, um, because I know there has been some feedback around that. Uh, and finally, I would ask you, as I did last time, to also consider reviewing your own portfolio, which might include um, adjusting your stop loss as we're currently having quite a large drawdown. So some of you have asked me uh, whether it's a good idea to, you know, just increase your stop loss a bit more. Again, this is not any advice. I advise everybody to consider their own uh, individual situation, but because of the ongoing volatility, I have gotten a lot of messages from copiers whose stop loss got triggered because there's so much of fluctuation in, in single days in the stock market, which is a bit unprecedented. Um, and then finally, just a few final notes. Um, again, reminders, <laughs> uh, even though this, uh, you know, caused a bit of um, 
debate on my page, I will continue to remind my copiers to deposit into the stock market. I do this myself. I will continue to do this in my secondary and alternative investments for the going into the rest of this year. Uh, and I will continue to remind you to do the same because it's a fundamental part of my investment philosophy. It's how I believe I pay myself. It's how I've built this portfolio. So it is something that has served me very well and something that I love to share with my copiers because I've benefited so much from it over the last um, decade. Uh, secondly, will just be a reminder to sign up for the mailing list, uh, which you can use the QR code here or the link. It's on my link tree, everything is there. Uh, and that kind of leads me to my next point, which is the announcement of the copier survey. So as far as I know, this is I'm the first popular investor to do this. Um, and I will be starting to do more things uh, independent of eToro. For example, this webinar or this meeting today, it was not organized by eToro like the uh, one that happened on Tuesday, but I felt that perhaps not everybody could make the time or um, I don't think the inv invitations went out to everybody. So I decided to have this event again, have it independent, invite all of my copiers. Um, and so the copier survey, as I said, will be going out on my mailing list. Um, and the idea for that would really be, as I said in the video yesterday, that elite pro popular investors, there's only a handful of us. It's a very exciting and developing um, position. We get to give eToro a lot of feedback about what the requirements for this should be. Uh, at the moment, I not only meet the requirement for eToro, which is one post a month, I far supersede that. Uh, I put out one, almost one post a week uh, in a normal week. Um, but still, I feel that, you know, there is great input that I can get from my copiers. And this is also as I'm starting to develop uh, other services um, away from, you know, not related to eToro. Uh, one of the things that we will be launching is one-on-one -on -one meetings. So if you have any questions about your copy or your portfolio, or just talking about the stock market, you would be able to... Um, book that time with me uh, and to have that discussion. And so these are all things which are developing. So the copier survey will be coming out on the 6th of August. I will continue to remind you about it because you will have to sign up for the mailing list. It'll be going out via the mailing list. Um, and so make sure to sign up for that. I'll continue to, to remind you. And um, with that, I have come to the end of my presentation. Um, we have time for some questions. If anybody has, um, if anybody has any questions that they want to ask, um, we have a few minutes remaining. Um, but hopefully, I did answer all of the questions. You know, when I went through the presentation because I did this earlier in the week, I sort of had a good anticipation of what. What would be your questions? So if you have any questions, um, please put them in the question box. I can talk through them now. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for everybody for joining. Uh, it was really great to have, you know, my first uh, independent um, session, live session with my copiers, not hosted or organized by Toro. Uh, and I look forward to having them uh, more frequently in the future, getting to, to interact directly with uh, my copiers. Um, so there's a question um, just coming in about, am I looking at any exposure to emerging markets? So um, as I said, when I looked at the sector allocation, we do currently have some exposure to uh, China through a mutual fund, so it's not through individual stocks, uh, as well as to India. Um, I usually tend to keep my exposure to emerging markets to less than 5%. I think that's a healthy balance of giving us the upside, but uh, at the same time, emerging markets can be really volatile. So uh, because this is a medium risk portfolio and I'm committed to keeping it as, as such for my copiers, um, yeah, I will be keeping that. 
a bit limited, but yeah, it is, it's a good time to be keeping an eye on the emerging markets, because as I said, this will really be in the next half of the year, there will be a sort of a race, or not a race, but to see who recovers better from the inflation. Um, and yeah, emerging markets might be well placed to, to take advantage of that. So definitely something to, to keep an eye out on. Um, yeah, if there's any other questions, please put them in the chat box. Um, otherwise, I would say thank you so much for everybody for coming. Uh, as always, um, I am available through most, oh, I just got a, uh, sorry, I just got a note from the moderator saying there's an open question. Uh, Claudia is asking whether I would consider it convenient to add a deposit with and copy open trades in this period and just make periodic deposits without copying open trades. That is absolutely, in my personal opinion, the best strategy that you could do. Um, I spoke about it in the video yesterday, but I'm, uh, I'd like to reiterate that here. If you didn't get to add uh, funds with us in July, or if you have any funds coming available uh, for the rest of the year, I always advise, that's what I do personally, um, that you do add it. If you are adding it to the copy uh, and you decide not to, I would recommend not to open uh, copy, copy open trades uh, if you're adding, because that would um, allow you to add any, any amount. I think there are some limitations. If you do decide to copy open trades, you have a minimum uh, amount that you have to add. So I always say, rather than waiting for, for that lump sum to become available, just add it when you remember, when you can. I think it also now allows you to make uh, set up regular deposits, which I think is like, a, you, unfortunately, you can't do regular deposits to a copy, but you can do regular deposits to your eToro portfolio, which uh, is a brilliant um, feature. I wish it was there when I started my portfolio six years ago, because I used to at the start of every month add uh, before my expenses came up. So uh, absolutely, if you want to continue to add, add a deposit, um, I would also add that, uh, as I mentioned, there is that big cash lump sum still sitting available because I haven't used a lot of it. I think I've only opened a small number of trades this month. So if you didn't add with me um, in the beginning of the month, but you still would like to do that now, you can still do that now. Do not copy open trades because that would mean that that cash uh, that you're adding the deposit will sit available ready to go with the cash that I'll be deploying. So if you didn't add in the beginning of the month, you can still add now because I haven't used a lot of that fund, funds. Um, and as I said, I anticipate that I'll start using them at the end of this month as all the information comes out. So uh, I'm gonna say thank you to everyone and I'm gonna, I'm running one minute over. So I'm gonna be conscious of everybody's time. Uh, but again, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for joining. Um, and if you have any other questions, please reach out to me uh, via Linktree. It's always on, on my uh, eToro page. So um, yes, and look out for my copier survey. And with that, I'll see you at the next quarterly call. Bye.